This building is a chapel. But the fact is, it's only one part of one of the greatest building operations conducted in medieval England. A building like this had a specific purpose, which was to uh, adorn, celebrate, house the popular devotions to the Virgin Mary that were becoming increasingly common in the 13th and 14th century, the age of Gothic art. It instantly draws you in, and you have two emotions. You have the sense of just how compelling this art is and how it wins you over. And you also have this tremendous historical sense of loss, of how much has been erased from the Middle Ages. And so it's, its history is tragic, and yet just enough remains to tell us so much about the mental and spiritual and artistic life of, of the people that made it. We're standing in the Lady Chapel of the Cathedral at Ely, which is in the heart of East Anglia. It's a very windswept and cold place, but in the Middle Ages, it was a very important architectural and artistic center. This building was begun in the year 1321, and it was completed 28 years later. Within a very few years, right next door to it, was constructed the great octagon at the center of the church. It's as high as the Pantheon in Rome. It was a miracle of engineering. The Lady Chapel is a miracle of what you might call compression. It's very intense pictorialization of the idea of the Virgin Mary herself. And the name that has been given to this kind of style, which is extremely ornate and inventive, is the decorated style. The decorated style has certain specific things to look out for. In particular, a, a sort of Alice in Wonderland sense of scale tiny motifs that grow very big and very big motifs that get very small. You've got lots of foliage, carved foliage everywhere. It's like coral. It's amazingly delicate and intricate and kind of weird. And you've got some forms particularly fascinating. They have a kind of S shape. They're called OG arches. The OG arch itself starts in India in the pre-Christian era. You find it in Buddhist art, you find it in Islamic art, you find it in Byzantine art. It arrives in East Anglia, of all places, in the 14th century, and it becomes a kind of a language which, with which they spoke naturally, and they spoke of the Virgin Mary through this language. When people entered this building, it's very important to remember that this is a chapel with diverse audiences. The lay people, the ordinary pilgrims, came in through the lay entrance, which is over there, and the first thing they saw was the very beginning of the life of the Virgin Mary. Then you get into the real business end of the narrative. You get the annunciation, uh, the visitation, and the really big uh, narrative moments occur on the big buttresses. Mary goes up to heaven bodily, and then she starts to perform miracles on earth, and there's a whole string of quite lively miracles, which are particularly racy as you get into the monk's part. The fascinating thing is that the slightly, how can I put it, slightly raunchy stories about booze and sex and pride were not for the lay people at all, it, they were for the monks. people come into this building to be healed, cheered up. But above all, they would have thought about this in, in kind of medicinal terms, that you're sweetened by the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. 
my thought is this. Was the curving OG arch and the beautiful, slightly fleshy consistency of the architecture here, was it in a way a metaphor or a communicative vehicle for the idea of femininity? What they were doing at Ely was producing an architecture that in itself would have made people subliminally aware of the Virgin Mary as a kind of physical presence, as something which we love, we're drawn to. The second thing was colour. This building was like a hothouse of colour. What we see now is like a bleached remnant of something that was altogether more exotic. And finally, stained glass. So much more striking. We might not have liked it, but we would undoubtedly have been impressed by it. Iconoclasm, uh, literally, is the destruction of images. Basically, the, the censorship of anything that is a representation. This building was absolutely packed with sculpture. A lot of that has gone, simply torn away. In the 16th and 17th century, when the English Reformation uh, occurred, a long drawn out and very violent process, very divisive process, the targeting, deliberate targeting of the central symbols of Catholicism um, was important. And certainly in this part of England, which was really the birthplace of the Protestant Reformation, there was a violent sentiment against uh, all the things that had uh, two centuries before been extremely um, loved, uh, respected and regarded. And the cult of the Virgin Mary was swept away. The theory is always that by getting rid of the concrete expression of something, by erasing it, you, you, you disempower the idea and you disempower the perpetuation of the idea. It's a way of erasing memory. So when I speak about the art and architecture here being persuasive, being sweetening, we have to understand that to a Protestant reformer, all these little, what they would call puppets, these statues all around the room, all the little stories would be deeply interesting, but also repulsive and dangerous. And as a result of that, what I call hammer-happy iconoclasts went for this building with a kind of enthusiasm. All the statues were pulled down in the upper parts of the wall, all the stained glass just smashed out, and all the delicate little uh, stories of the Virgin Mary, all her little miracles, whacked off with hammers, all the heads went, some of them are unrecognisable, and the colour was scrubbed off. And the whole thing, it was an effort to kind of cancel it, to destroy its power. I think the mood of this building now is kind of melancholy. In a sense, it's not quite a ruin, but it speaks to us poetically of something that has been lost, but which we can recover in our imaginations. Ely stands out for not just its technical brilliance, but its ambition on two levels, its ambition of scale and its ambition of invention. There's nothing else really quite like it at this date in the whole of Europe. I think it's possibly the only moment in the history of, of art when the art of England is supreme invention.